Hello. Oh, thank you guys so much for <laughs> for allowing me to share with you guys tonight. Um, basically, my takeaways for from the Women Winter Workshop. Um, I'm really excited to be able to speak with you, ladies. And um, the title of my lesson is called "Running Out of Time." And I don't really have any specific points um, because I wanted this to just move more like a conversation with you ladies. And then at the end, kind of give a challenge and some practicals as well. And so I have to admit, I didn't really know what to expect out of this winter workshop. Um, I'd been a disciple for almost 10 years, which also means that I will almost have been to 10 workshops. And like most of you, this is my very first virtual workshop. And I remember that when we met in person, I would really get caught up in the structure of the workshops, seeing old friends, having a jam-packed schedule filled with quiet times with other sisters and encouragement dates, um, unexpected discipling times, and then always late nights and very early mornings. And I also would song lead. So depending upon the church that we were in, whether it was in Los Angeles or New York or here in Sacramento, I would be prepared to get to service for song practice one and a half to two hours before the services would even begin. And so in between all that hustle and bustle, I would take as many notes as I could during the sermons and I would always walk away feeling very inspired, but I would never go back to those notes again. And I would sift through them every time we would pack up to move, you know, we moved across, across country from LA to New York. But I can't say that I ever really implemented what once was so inspiring to me. And I can't help but compare my personal growth from this workshop with the workshops in the past. And again, although it was a virtual work workshop and there were no encouragement dates and <laughs> no unexpected deed times, no song leading, um, this workshop was truly different for me and made a lasting impression on me. And when I was asked what I got out of this workshop, honestly, my answer had nothing to do with faith, directly that is. But I knew that I needed to re-stimulate my prayer life. Now, there was a lesson in particular that was, that there wasn't a lesson in particular that was centered around prayer because that, you know, isn't really what our, thir our church theme is for this year. But with every lesson I heard and every sermonette, I heard about vision, purpose, moving mountains, being faithful in different aspects of our lives, such as leadership, delegation, generosity, or even dating. One cannot be faithful without first being prayerful. And for me, the workshop really started on Wednesday with Shay Sears' lesson, which had a very clever title, Hindsight is 2020. I mean, if, if this winter workshop was a grand opening for 2021, Shay's lesson would be a soft opening just for members only, just for us ladies. Although there was nothing soft about it, right? She compelled us to get a vision, not a self, a self help vision, but a real meaty vision after God's own heart. And I have to admit, I was awestruck because I had never intentionally determined that God's vision should also be my vision. And so, really, this begins with prayer. And this is why my vision for 2021 and hopefully the rest of my life is to intentionally pray in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening to the Lord. And I wanted to talk about a term that isn't necessarily discussed on a daily basis, but each, of, each one of us has really experienced it in some way. And this term is called regression. And it's defined as a return to a former or less developed state a return to an earlier stage of life or supposed previous life, especially through hypnosis or mental illness, or as a means of escaping present anxieties, regression. Now, sleep regression is the act of returning to a less developed state of sleep. And right when this workshop began, so did my daughter, Eva, <laughs> her very first sleep regression. Instead of sleeping, <laughs> instead of sleeping through the night, she fought going to sleep. Like normally she's 
we put her down at seven o'clock, seven thirty. She's probably asleep by eight o'clock, but she started not going to sleep until 10 o'clock, 1030, even after putting her down so early. And then she would start to wake up at 1230, one o'clock in the morning and wouldn't go back to sleep until 430, five o'clock. I was left feeling anxious, frustrated, annoyed, extremely sleep deprived, saying things that a mom should never say or even wish and lacking the ability to really see the bright side or the light at the end of the tunnel. And one night, though, with the crying, the screaming, the inability to get back to sleep, it was so much that once she finally did sleep, I couldn't. I tossed, I turned, I fluffed my pillows, I refluffed my pillows, I repositioned my body multiple times. And I told my husband, Bobby, that I was so uncomfortable in my own bed that I couldn't sleep. And he gently yet firmly told me that this is happening so that you rely on God instead of the comfortability of your sleep. And it looks like he's trying to show you that you have your, your hope set on the wrong things. So I guess this sleep regression has less to do with Eva's sleep and more to do with my own personal prayer regression. My prayer life had returned to a less developed state. And so, the next morning, I reached out to a few married women. Come on, Monica, come on, Cindy, they got my back. <laughs> and they told me to go and have a Garden of Gethsemane prayer, which I can say that I don't think I've ever done since before I became a disciple. And right away, I SOSed D'Lo. I was like, D'Lo, I need you, please. How soon can you get here? I just need a chance to breathe and a chance to just go pray. And she came over so quickly. I'm so grateful for her. Thank you, D'Lo. <laughs> and I went to the park, you know, I went to uh, Natomas Regional Park and I laid down my blanket in front of the pond and I sat on my blanket and I read Luke chapter 22. So if you ladies can turn there with me in the book of Luke. Chapter 22, starting in verse 39, it says, then accompanied by the disciples, and I'm also using the NLT version, then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not be overcome by temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last, he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping? He asked. Get up and pray. Otherwise, temptation will overpower you. So, you know, most of the time, when I read the scripture, it's usually during a discipleship or cross study. And we focus typically on Jesus's ability to be able to surrender, to be able to, to do what God's will is and pray for God's will, not just his own will. And in verse 45 and 46, it says that Jesus saw his disciples exhausted from grief. I mean, he, it's interesting because it, he sees that they're exhausted from grief. And then he continues to ask them, why are you sleeping? Right. <laughs> but this was me. I was exhausted. I mean, exhausted was an absolute understatement. I felt nauseous from exhaustion. If, if you guys have ever been sleep deprived before, I don't know if you felt nauseous before you have a headache, you have no energy. I had no appetite all day, but Jesus commanded them to get up and pray to move, to move out of their situation. Don't remain lying on the ground in your same sleep regress state, but to move. I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, I've had gone through like a hardship and I remain in my bed in the same position praying or I get up in the morning and I'm just praying, laying in bed. I'm not actually physically moving. But then Jesus also warns them, otherwise temptation will overpower you. And this is exactly what happened to me. I was overwhelmed and overpowered by temptation. I gave into horrible thoughts about not wanting to be a mom anymore. I was overpowered by temptation when I became so frustrated that my husband wasn't doing enough or wasn't controlling the situation the right way or the way that I wanted it to be controlled. 
And that entire night, I never really stopped to truly pray, which I had prayer regression. That's exactly what I had. You know, during the, uh, the workshop, the story of one of the disciples being unable to remove a demon out of a boy was read. And in Mark, you guys can turn with me as well, to Mark chapter 9. Turning in verse 17. It says, one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, teacher, I brought my son for you to heal him. He can't speak because he's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. Whenever this evil spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground and makes him foam at the mouth and grind his teeth and become rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you until you believe? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And then skipping down to verse 25, it says that when Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit spirit of deafness and muteness, he said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy lay there motionless and he appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd. He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. Jesus said that this demon was only able to be removed by prayer. You know, it really didn't hit me until this point in the workshop, how critical prayer is to faith. The uh, NLT commentary for verse 29 says that prayer is the key that unlocks faith in our life and that prayer demonstrates our reliance on God. So I really wanted to challenge you ladies to start thinking about the state of your prayer life. Take an assessment to really determine what the correlation is between your prayers and your faith. Allow yourself to have a year of mountain moving faith and then some, because you're due to your prayer life starting to get re-stimulated. And you know, after that instance of when I was fluffing my pillows and I had a super horrible night and I was so frustrated and annoyed trying to get comfortable in bed, Um, another sleepless night happened pretty much the night after. And this time I got down on my knees, I got out of bed and I prayed with tears. Um, Did the sleep regression, Eva's sleep regression cease? No, it didn't. But I wasn't overpowered with temptation. Even on only three hours of sleep that day, I wasn't as beaten down as I was before. And so my, le- my lesson is titled Running Out of Time because that's what we who are living today have in common. We're literally running out of time for God's vision to work in our lives. He only gives us so many years to live. In order for that vision to truly exist, we must allow prayer to be the key that unlocks our faith. Thank you for allowing me to share. Come on, Kenzie. That was <laughs> Let's go, Lex. That's awesome. Well, ladies, let's give it up for uh, <laughs> let's give it up for Kenzie one more time. That was awesome. Thank you so much, sis, for just sharing your heart so vulnerably. Um, so awesome just to hear how much you've overcome already. Can't wait to hear how much you continue to overcome. Um, but as Jackie said, my name is Alexis, and I'm super grateful to have uh, this time just to share um, what are some things that I got out of the winter workshop this past. Uh, weekend, you know, and it was a great winter workshop. You know, it's a time of just uh, a lot of lessons, a lot of teaching. It's a lot. <laughs> it's, I had a little bit of sensory overload, you know. Um, but for me, it was a really, a really great time of refreshment. I went into it kind of like, uh, okay, revive me. You know, I just need something to jolt me out of this kind of funk I was in. Um, but I think that through the, the whole winter workshop, there were two lessons that really stuck out the most to me. And the first lesson, what uh, Kenzie was sharing was Shay's lesson, Hindsight is 2020, which was kind of like a prelude leading up to the winter workshop. And it was an awesome, awesome lesson. And I really loved how Shay started off the lesson and, and she was sharing about how God is a visionary. Um, she shared the scripture in, in Romans 417 
which says, he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believes. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. And this scripture, it really stuck with me. When she read it, I was just kind of, I was kind of stuck there for a minute because I really soaked it in and really thought about what it meant. And the scripture really just talks about the power of God and how much he really can do. You know, anything is within God's reach. There's nothing that's too big for him. There's no feat that that is with, um, without his, his ability to do. He can do whatever he wants, you know. And I think the biggest thing that really shows that is the creation of the world. When God created the world, all he did was speak. He said, let there be light. Boom, light was there, you know. That's how he created the earth. That's how he created the oceans. That's how we were created. God literally spoke us into existence. And it's so amazing, you know, to really think about that and to think about how God can answer any prayer and how God can move any mountain. But I think for me, this was, this was not the kind of faith that I had, you know, coming into 2021. It was, it was a very hard and challenging year. And I think for myself, um, you know, this is something I tell the women I disciple all the time. Like, it's been a rough year for everyone. Like, everyone has had a hard year. You think you've had a hard year. Look around. <laughs> Everyone's going through something. Um, but I think just even leading up to the one workshop, um, you know, I haven't told too many people, but my sister, she actually had two strokes, um, like, back to back, day after day. Um, and she was hospitalized. And um, you know, she couldn't talk, like all of her motor functions were, were pretty poor. And it, it, it caused a lot of fear in me, honestly, I was, I was internally, I was freaking out. You know, when you think about what a stroke is, and, and what it does is a part of your brain dies, and it's, it's not functioning properly. And um, I just got really scared, you know, um, really, really scared for my sister's life. You know, my sister, she studied the Bible before, but she fell off. And so I had to, to really pray and, and really have a kind of faith that God can do anything. As the scripture says, um, that he can call people that are dead, have dead situations, or their spirituality is dead. He can revive that. Um, but he can also call into things that were never there. And that really is the, the magnificence of our God. You know, it's that, it's that he's beyond what we think. He has no limits when we set limits. And um, for this past year, I really saw how, how I, I did not believe this scripture. Instead of seeing the God behind my mountain, I only saw the mountain. I would tell God, God, look how big this mountain is. It's too impossible to overcome. Um, and I stopped seeing how big God was and, and how much he really is in control. And I had given way to a lot of faithlessness, you know? Um, I became so focused on me, on my strength, what I could do, what I can accomplish, but not on God or his power. And, and when things got too hard, too challenging, or too unfamiliar, I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> time out, because I don't know what I'm doing. Let me just, uh, Devin, take over. Devin, do this. Devin, 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 Devin. But I, I really had to I see this. how my fear really overtook me. Um, and so that was the biggest thing that I really saw was just my lack of faith in God and really seeing God for who he really is. Um, but the other thing that Shay had talked about in her lesson that just, that hit me like a ton of bricks was, was when she was talking about the responsibility that comes with the vision, you know, and she asked a question and I want to ask you it too, if you weren't there, or maybe you don't remember, she asked, do you feel the burden of the evangelization of the nation? Do you feel that you're personally responsible to help seek and save the lost, that you actually make an eternal impact, whether you choose to fight or whether you choose not to join? And for myself, like this past year was a lot. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I can't fix all these problems. I can't fix the world. You know what? But I can fix one thing and that's me. And so I just got super focused on myself you know, growing in my character, things that I want to do, things that I want to change. And those are all great things, you know. God wants me to really, like, learn how to control myself and my emotions and grow my character. But 
where it got sinful for me was that that was all I focused on. And I forgot about the lost world. Um, and so for me, I, I really saw myself, okay, I had become faceless. And I had become so focused on myself, which led me to Sarah's um, lesson, which she preached on Saturday, which, which she entitled, Where the Righteous live, Will Live by Faith. Um, and that's really the title of my lesson tonight, guys. It's, it's live by faith, because that's what I'm trying and striving to do. It's to live oh, by I faith. Go. But in Sarah's final point on her lesson, she was talking about the gospel of peace. You know, and she referenced Romans 1.16, and in which she talked about how Paul, um, one of the one of the most impactful apostles of the gospel, um, was how he was not ashamed of the gospel. He wasn't ashamed to share his faith. You know, it was the very power of God. He was very in touch with God's grace. Uh, and that's what fueled him to keep going. You know, he had faith in God and how much God had changed his life to being a Christian killer, to being a Christian himself and making more Christians, you know. But for me, uh, <laughs> I can't say that I'm the same way. You know, at times I can grow, I can grow very ashamed of the gospel or I'm ashamed to share my faith you know, and I allow, again, all of these fears to come in. I'm afraid of being rejected. Um, and I have all of these excuses where I think, okay, people won't hear me because I'm talking and they can't see my lips moving and I'm wearing a mask. So boom, there's something right there, you know, or people aren't going to want to talk to me, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. People were just so afraid of everything, you know. Um, I thought people would think I'm weird. I'll be judged. You know, I thought I can't be fruitful during this pandemic. My family will never become disciples. I can never help another woman. It's just too hard. And all of these things are excuses or they're lies that I allowed to remain in my mind instead of choosing to live by faith, you know? And after reflecting on the winter workshop, these were the things that really left a mark on my heart. Um, and I really saw who I really was. You know, I was, like, I was just shattered, guys, emotionally, spiritually. I was like, man, like, wow, like, wow, I've allowed all of these things to overtake me. But I'm not going to stay there, you know, and I really want to change. And it's really awesome because I had a quiet time a few days after the workshop that really showed me what to do. And I want to share it with you because it's super inspiring and it gives us a lot of practical. Come on, uh, So turn with me uh, well, to Jeremiah. Is chapter 26, Jeremiah chapter 26 and verse 1, we'll pick it up here. It says, early in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says, stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the town of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen, and each will turn from their evil ways. Then I will relent and not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. And right here in this passage, God is giving Jeremiah specific instructions to go preach to the people of Israel and to really show, guys, how, how much you have fallen. You know, you guys have turned to all these, these false idols, um, all this false uh, idolatry, but God's really trying to get you back to him, you know, and God's going to bring like this destruction on you. Jeremiah was known as like the prophet of doom because all he, he preached about was doom, uh, like destruction, you know, but I mean, that's what God was, was hoping that they would do like, in verse three. It says, perhaps they will listen, perhaps they will change. And I think about how this relates to me. You know, sometimes I feel like God is calling me to go share my faith with a specific person as I'm going out and at the grocery store, I'm at the mall, like God's like, go share and don't omit a word, you know, and I'm like, uh, like you, you know, you know, you know, you know, when God's like, go share your faith and you're like, oh, okay, must you have the courage, right? And so that's exactly what Jeremiah was told here. But let's see how he responds. Um, drop down with me. Uh, to verse 7 and it says the priests the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speak these words in the house of the Lord but as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say the priests the prophets and all the people seized him and said you must die 
wow. <laughs> I mean, okay, here Jeremiah is. He's just being a faithful prophet, right? He's doing exactly what God says, and then boom, death threat. Like, come on, man. Like, can you catch a break? <laughs> I, I mean, if, if I had done all this, I'm like, okay, God, I need some little encouragement. These people are really intimidating, and then boom, death threats, right? So let's see, what does Jeremiah actually do? How does he respond to this situation? Well, I'm glad you asked. Turn with me to verse 14, and it says, As for me, I am in your hands. Do with me whatever you think is good and right. Be assured, however, that if you put me to death, you will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on the city and on those who live in it. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, this man should not be sentenced to death. He has spoken to us in the name of the Lord, our God. Wow. This is super cool. <laughs> um, you know, like Jeremiah, first he's like, you know what? Do with me what you will. I don't even care. You could kill me. You could keep me alive. But just know that what I am saying is the very words of God. And I think for me, like God has put me in a lot of situations this past year where he's really challenged me to really grow and in my knowledge and my, my understanding, but also in my preaching, you know, and, and just like the Bible says here, like Jeremiah had to preach some really hard things. And sometimes for us, we have to call people to the standards, which is not always easy. People don't always like being challenged or being confronted with where they're at spiritually, biblically, right? Um, but Jeremiah wasn't afraid of what the consequences were. And in fact, he was willing to submit even to death just to be able to preach God's word, right? And then the people are like, whoa, okay, like, guys, we need to take it easy. I mean, Jeremiah, he's actually, he's a man from God. Take it easy, right? Um, and that's definitely like my heart. I definitely want to be like Jeremiah. Um, but let's look at another guy who, who has the same situation as Jeremiah but actually had a different turn of events. So if you drop down to verse 20, it says, Now Uriah, son of Shemaiah from Kirith, Jeremim, was another man who prophesied in the name of the Lord. He prophesied the same things against the city and this land as Jeremiah did. When King Jehoiakim and all his officers and, and officials heard his words, the king was determined to put him to death. But Uriah heard of it and fled in fear to Egypt. King Jehoiakim, however, sent El Elphanan, son of Akbar, to Egypt, along with some other men. They brought Uriah out of Egypt. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. They brought Uriah out of Egypt and took him to King Jehoiakim, who had him struck down with a sword and his body thrown into the burial place of the common people. Yikes. Right? So Uriah is another prophet. And he preached the same things that, that Jeremiah preached. Um, and he was also threatened with, with death, right? But his response was different. When he heard of the death threat, it says in verse 21, when he heard of it, he fled in fear to Egypt. He ran away, you know? And I think about, man, man, like what would have happened if he didn't flee? Maybe he, he fled because he, he didn't know. He didn't actually have a trust in God. Or maybe he valued his life too much. Maybe he valued his, his reputation more than he valued actually living out what God called him to do. And for me, I can find myself exactly there where I value people's opinion too much more than I value what God wants me to do. And I can flee in fear just like Uriah did, right? And we see his, like what eventually happens to him, like he gets, he gets killed, right? But, but we can see the, the contrast between Jeremiah and Uriah, where Jeremiah chose to, to surrender to whatever God's will was, um, but that he was going to see it through to completion, where Uriah, he fled in fear when things got challenging. And so for, for us ladies, I really want to implement a, a practical with you guys and to challenge you to go after is to live like Jeremiah, right? To not be ashamed of the gospel, that when we're out there sharing our faith, um, you share with the most intimidating person that you come across, which for me is hard. <laughs> a lot of people look intimidating, right? Um, especially like today we went sharing at the mall and I was like, man, this woman looks really intimidating. She looks really put together and I look busted, you know? Um, but I had really put it on my heart to just 
man, like, what do I have to lose? What do I have to lose? If I open my mouth and I invite this woman to church, the most she can do is say no. She's not going to kill me. I mean, she could, but that's illegal here in America. But she has everything to gain, right? Man, her life can be radically changed. We went sharing the other night and we, we met this woman and it was just really sad. Like, like she, she's out here on her own. She has a four-year-old son and you can just see the sadness in her eyes as she's like, yeah, I don't have anybody. I'm looking for a community. I'm looking for somebody here in Sacramento. You can just see, she just desperately wants it. And I'm like, man, like she has everything to gain. I have nothing to lose, you know? And so I really want to challenge you ladies that, that first that you go to God and, and you really pray faith faithfully that you really see God for who he is and how uh, magnificent he is that he can move any mountain but that also too we're doing the work to help God move that mountain that we're sharing our faith daily so we're actually sharing it powerfully with people who who may intimidate us right that we're not going to hold back whether we're in bible studies whether we're in discipling times or whether we're just out on the street you know um but Ladies, let's go and and be those women who live by faith and watch God move the mountain. I love you so much. Thanks for letting me share. I love the and Alexis lesson. I feel like all of our lessons are gonna like tie in together. Um, but just like they were both saying, you know, like this past winter workshop was. Um, super impactful, super inspiring, super convicting, um, a call higher for sure in our, our heart to go after, you know, our faith in God, you know, from Shay's lesson before the workshop to the sermonette, Sarah's lesson, Jason's lesson, there were so many lessons and so many things to soak up. Um, but I think um, it really pushed me to go after being consistent in my faith. And in fact, I made it one of my goals to just be consistent um, in my walk with God. And that's in everything, you know, and I want to share the, uh, the definition of consistent. It's acting or done in the same way over time, especially so as to be fair or accurate, unchanging in nature, standard, or effect over time. Some of the synonym, uh, synonyms are steady, unswerving, stable, unchanging, and the list for sure goes on. Um, and when I read this um, definition, I was like, man, does this look like my walk with God? And I want to ask you guys the same thing. Does this look like your walk with God, you know, where you're, you're steady in your quiet times, where you're unchanging in your convictions on sharing your faith with this lost world, you know, where you're um, stable in taking discipling from your disciplers and um, from disciples, you know, where you're unswerving in your overall devotion to God. Come and on, Laura. That's funny. Um, I was like, man, like, I had to really have a, a huge heart check on uh, my consistency with God because I can really struggle with it. And I, I just sat and thought about it. And I, I believe one of the most radical things you can do um, in your walk with God is be consistent. And the title of my lesson for you guys tonight is Radical Consistency. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. I know one of the things that can um, stop me personally um, from being consistent with my walk with God is actually something uh, Sarah shared in her lesson. Um, she read Acts 14, um, verse 22. It says, um, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remember and to remain true to the faith, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And um, to be honest, I can really struggle when hardships come to be consistent with my walk with God. Um, and I'm just going to share a little bit about my life um, and my, my, well, my journey as a disciple and how this has been something that I've been wanting to go after. And this is the year that I want to go after with consistency. Um, I was actually baptized March 27th, 2016. So I became a disciple uh, almost five years ago. And um, I dive right into it, you know, just like everybody else. You're like, you don't know what to expect, but you're like, okay, I'm going to go wholehearted, you know, and then um, I experienced my first death in the kingdom. My grandmother passed away. And I was like, um, what, God? Like, is this what you're going to do? Like, you know, and it kind of dimmed my faith a bit. And um, I took some time to, like, really go after my relationship with God. But I had, like, some struggling moments, you know. And because of it, I lost a lot of vision, too. Um, 
But then I was like, oh, I want to go to ICCM. But I didn't get a chance to go into ICCM until later after. Um, I wasn't leading anything at the time. And then I got the chance to lead um, the Hayward House Church, which was um, awesome, but I was also scared. But the minute I go out there, man, it was a, it was a kind of a struggling team. You know, people fell away. Um, anything that could go wrong went wrong. And I was like, really, God, is this what you want from me? You know, and, um, and during that course of me being there, my grandfather passed away and then my nephew passed away. And a little bit after that, my dad passed away. And it was like, man, I'm like, man, I'm getting hit after hit. And I'm like, after that, I'm, I can get, like, my prayers were like angry, angry prayers if I was having any of it at all. You know, I was angry with God. I, I was like, man, I don't even know if I want to do this, God. I don't even know if this is what you want from me. I don't, like, I'm like, you, you only want me in pain, you know? And um, then I got sent to go to uh, San Francisco with one of my best friends, and we got to lead a campus ministry. And then he falls away. And I'm like, what the heck? I'm like, God, what the heck? And then I got pulled all the way back to be under someone else in a Bible talk. And I was like, man, at this point, I don't even, I don't even know what you want, you know? And I had just like a face of like, oh God, you get on my nerves. And everybody can see it. I don't know if you, you guys know I'm a, a, a dramatic person. So you can tell what I'm feeling on my face. And I just like, I was just so done with it, you know? And then God has called me here to sack. And I get to sack and you guys welcome me with oh. open arms. Um, and I was just very encouraged by you guys. And honestly, being out here, I've been the most fruitful I've ever been. You know, I've been able to see you guys transform in so many ways and it encouraged me, you know, and it just helped me to remember that, you know, us as disciples, we're going to go through a lot of things and there's going to be troubled times and moments, but I can't allow it to push me to, uh, draw away from God. I have to be consistent in it. And my first and only point I have for you guys um, is radical consistency through hardship. Um, on, Nora. And, uh, when I think of someone who was consistent through hardship in the Bible, I always think of Job, you know, um, let's actually go there, Job chapter one. Um, and I'm just going to kind of briefly share a little bit about the first few verses because I don't think we have time to read up through all of them. But Job, he, it, it talks about how Job was an upright man, right? You know, um, he was blameless, you know, he was a very righteous man and he had a lot of wealth too, you know, so he was like thousands of camels and oxen and all these different things. And he was even a family man. It talked about how he had like deep conviction in like making sure that his family was close to God. So he would do his own personal sacrificial atonement for his family, right? And one, one day, basically Satan is like roaming around and God's like, where, where you been at? What you been doing? You know? And he's like, God's like, hey, have you considered my servant Job? You know, have you considered Job? Like going after Job and Satan basically like is like saying all these things like, well, does Job really fear you? Like, of course he's gonna be with you because he has all this stuff, right? He has a hedge around his household. Like he has these, all. surely if you take those things away, he's gonna curse you, you know? And I want us to actually pick up um, in verse 13 See what happens as God basically allows Satan to go and test Job. Um, here in verse 13, it says, One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabines attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who, was, who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants and, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed their raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. When suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Whoa, right? This is crazy. I, couldn't, I can't even imagine, right? You know, what do we see here? Like Job was stripped of everything, right? 
you know, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his servants, his camels. Um, and the one that probably really hit him the most was his children, right? And it's crazy because in this time you think easily before we even finish the rest of the verses that one, he may be bitter, right? Like he may be angry, like how could you do this God? You know, he could sin against God, um, blame God for all of his heartache, right? But let's finish off the chapter here in verse 20. I'm picking up verse 20, it says, at this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshiped and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Um, wow, right? Job definitely had some feelings after all of that happened, right? Obviously, because it said that he tore his robe and shaved his head. Definitely took one after, you know, he definitely had emotions, but his emotions did not distract him from having conviction and still going to God, right? It said that he fell to the ground to worship God. It said in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And I was thinking like, man, this is intense, right? Because right now I'm reading Job, if y'all know, I'm reading Job for my quiet times. And I'm like, man, this is intense, right? I have to go after imitating the heart of Job in this way, you know? When things come up, um, are you going to choose to run to God or from God, you know? Um, and I think, man, it's something for us to actually check our hearts, you know, knowing that God will never obviously do anything to harm us, like it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, um, but we also have to remember that it's a spiritual battle, like it says in Ephesians 6, right? And I want to give us some practicals, you know, um, where we can actually just go after being consistent in our faith. And it's one of the things actually Kinsey, Kinsey mentioned was praying. Pray, pray, pray. Um, prayer is something that you see all throughout the Bible. You know, Jesus went and prayed often. You know, the disciples saw the strength that he got from prayer. And I think it's going to help us, especially in this year where we want to actually move mountains, right? Um, study out women who are were very faithful to God in the Bible. I think about Hannah, Mary, um, jo Jochebed um, is uh, actually a good one because she actually was very consistent and very faithful to trusting God. You know, she basically put Moses in the river, you know, and got the chance to be able to nurse her son. You know, because of that, Moses went to lead God's people out of Egypt. Um, another, uh, to get outward focus. Um, I think about um, actually 2 Samuel 11, um, I think, I believe it's verses one through four, um, where David, he actually sends somebody else to go to war, right? And he stays back in Jerusalem, right? And he got his mind off of the battle. And what happened? He immediately falls into sin with Bathsheba. And if we don't stay consistent and being in the battle, not taking our eyes off of the battle, you know, where we're going after sharing our faith consistently in Bible studies, taking disciplings in our deep times, filling our times up with God, we too could fall into sin the same way David did. And I think if we keep, we continue to have this heart we can actually move faithful mountains this year, God, to God do it. To God do it. Let's go, Janora. Let's go. 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 Let's go.